Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30. I want to speak today about grieving the Holy Spirit or not to grieve the Holy Spirit. How not to grieve the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30 and it says the following, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgiven you. The very idea we see in here where the Bible says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. The word grieve in this text means simply to cause grief. To grieve. To be in heaviness. To be sorrowful. To affect somebody with sadness. To cause grief and to throw somebody into sorrow. The word grief in a simple English is where we get our word getting your feelings hurt. The very idea, if I could re reread this, do not get the Holy Spirit's feelings hurt. That right away tells us something about the Holy Spirit that He is not a ghost, in the sense a spirit that doesn't have a personality, in the sense of force, in the sense of a dove, in the sense of a wind or oil, but He is a person that you can grieve, but if you can make somebody hurt, you can also make somebody happy. Right? Every married husband, every married wife, everyone who has parents, if you can make somebody hurt, you can also make somebody pleased. You can also make somebody be very excited by certain things that you do. The Holy Spirit is a divine person who lives within us and we as Christians have the ability to have a relationship with Him and we have the ability to cause Him deep heartbreak. It was actually Catherine Kuhlman said the very famous words that sometimes are used. She says, please don't grieve the Holy Spirit. He is all that I have. In one of the other services she said actually, that is one thing that I am so afraid of. I am afraid lest I grieve the Holy Spirit. For when the Holy Spirit is lifted from me, I am the most ordinary person that has ever lived. Now three things I want you to notice about the grieving the Holy Spirit. Number one and that is when we grieve the Holy Spirit, we actually break His heart. Secondly, when we grieve the Holy Spirit, we don't lose the Holy Spirit. The Bible in here does not say if you grieve the Holy Spirit, you lose being sealed by the Spirit. In fact, it says when you grieve the whole, do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. In a practical relationship example, if you are in a relationship with somebody and you break their heart, it doesn't mean you lose the relationship. It simply means your relationship now is still there but the intimacy, the closeness of that relationship is broken. When you grieve the Holy Spirit, you don't lose your salvation, but you lose the joy of your salvation. When you grieve the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit doesn't leave you. He stays there. The same way if you hurt your husband with your word, or you hurt your wife with your word, they don't divorce you. They will still be in the same house with you, probably sleep in the same bed, but you will feel a million miles away from them. What does happen when we grieve the Holy Spirit is we lose a sense that we are pleasing to God. We also lose peace. We become quickly and very fast irrit irritably. We become irritated very quickly. We lose sense of direction. We lose sense of consolation from the Holy Spirit. Our whole inside world goes into a turmoil and it goes into a chaos on the inside. And of course we quickly blame it on our spouse, we blame it on other people, but in reality if we quiet down and be very honest, we find out that us and the Holy Spirit are not on the same frequency. Us and the Holy Spirit are no longer enjoying the sweetness of that fellowship and the sweetness of that presence. The danger of living 
and grieving the Holy Spirit is this. The last thing that it will do is it will expose you to the demonic. In the same verse where Paul says do not grieve, in the same reference where Paul says do not grieve the Holy Spirit, in verse 27, so three verses above, Paul says do not give place to the devil. And three verses down, he says don't grieve the Holy Spirit. As you grieve the Holy Spirit, if you don't repent and you don't quickly fix that, you're opening the door to the demonic to come and take advantage of your vulnerable, hurt, broken place that you are in with God and the demons smell and they are attracted to people that grieve the Holy Spirit. I'm not saying you get a demon. I'm saying you potentially can get a demon. If you live in a state of the Holy Spirit being grieved by you. This happens in relationship as well. The Bible says do not let sun go down on our anger so we don't give place to the devil. If you stay angry overnight, you stay angry the second day, you stay angry the third day, you begin to develop thoughts in your mind about the person that you are angry. I wish them dead. They're so wrong. They get on my nerves all the time. That's it. I will never have a relationship with them again. And if it's your spouse, you begin to think, man, why did I even marry them? That person was right. I made a mistake about that. Why? Because when you allow anger, when you allow all of that frustration, when your heart is hurt and it's not being processed correctly, it exposes and it attracts all kinds of demonic rottens, demonic spirits. Living your life, living our life with ungrieved Holy Spirit is the greatest guarantee you will not be demonically harassed. Living your life where the Holy Spirit is not grieved by you is the greatest protection that demons will not have access to you. They will yell, they will bark, but they will not bite you because the Holy Spirit is pleased and He is your greatest defense mechanism. When the Holy Spirit is not grieved, what we experience is clarity of thought. What we experience is stillness and peace in the midst of the most chaotic, most difficult and most challenging situations in our life. When the Holy Spirit is not grieved, we have access to divine wisdom, divine strength and divine guidance. When the Holy Spirit is not grieved, you are a person, not just someone who has a big bank account, you actually have a debit card and a pin code to use it. When the Holy Spirit is grieved, what begins to happen, imagine yourself, my, David, uh, my friend David Diga used this example. Imagine yourself having a bank account where you have a million dollars, but you don't have a debit card to access that. So while you're rich, you also cannot use any of your riches. Why? Because your debit card is lost. And what you have to do is you have to go through the process of getting the debit card again. When the Holy Spirit is grieved, it's not that you no longer have the Holy Spirit and you no longer have the access, you do, but that contact point with the access is broken. The heart gets worse with time as it gets more sick, as it gets more hurt, it's more offended and all of these things will happen. In other words, what I'm trying to say is this, let's live our life in such a way where the Holy Spirit is ungrieved. Would you know if you grieved Him? Would you know if He's pleased? To even grieve the Holy Spirit, you have to have some kind of a closeness with Him. You have to have some kind of a nearness to Him to even know that He is grieved. This doesn't belong to people who don't have any kind of connection to, real, to the Holy Spirit. And some of us live our life without even knowing is the Holy Spirit pleased or He is not. And our desire that everyone at Hungry Gen watching our ministry will develop closer relationship with the Holy Spirit where we live our life and we know if He's pleased or He is not. And when He is not pleased, we do everything in our strength to reconnect, to restore and to renew that fellowship and to renew that relationship because our very life on this earth depends on it. Amen. If you've been with somebody, if you've been married, you probably can already know them. I've been married to my wife for 13 years. She's watching the stream right now. I know when she's not happy. She doesn't have to say anything. You smell it in the air. 
there's this vibe. Everything changes in the room. The room gets colder. Um, and she, and you know, and, and women, they could be a little bit deceptive sometimes. How are you doing? Fine. This is when you know nothing is fine. You know, I'm doing okay. And when you have a relationship with somebody and you love them and you are close to them, you pick up on those things very quickly. And then you, of course, you do whatever it takes in your power. You right away start thinking, what did I do? What did I not do? What did I say? What did I not say in the last 24 hours? Let's extend it to 72 hours. No, this, I, it couldn't be something that I've done before that. It has to be in the last 72 hours, maybe in the last three hours. So you examine your heart quickly like, man, I'm clean, I'm good. This must be something else. And then you probe around a little bit more and then you find out, okay, this is why this person is hurt. This is why this person is not feeling good right now. And you do your best to make the person feel very good. Imagine living with the Holy Spirit the same way. Now, yes, He's not easily offended, but He's hypersensitive. Hypersensitive, which tells us to know Him personally. We have to be aware that He has feelings, He has desires, and He could quietly depart and He can quietly lift. Not that He leaves us, but He can be, the Bible says in here, be hurt by us. Now, the amazing part is that the Holy Spirit is not such a mystery where we don't know what hurts them. I cannot say that about my wife though. Women sometimes are a mystery. You don't know what can hurt you. You can just do exactly the same thing you've been doing and then one day what you did is just hurt them. And so you constantly got to be on tiptoes and kind of constantly be a student of your person that you are married to. To The Bible says to, in Peter, it says that dwell with them with understanding. I'm like, Peter, that's impossible. I don't, I can't understand them. That's why the Bible requires the Holy Spirit to help us obey the Bible because it's very difficult. With the Holy Spirit, it's not that difficult because the Bible doesn't hide to us what grieves Him. In these verses, we see three things that grieve the Holy Spirit. And that's what I want to highlight today. In the summary, if you wanted to get all this stuff right away, is this, it's the way we live grieves the Holy Spirit. It's not always not reading enough of the Bible as much as not obeying any of it. Because so many of us think, yeah, I know the Holy Spirit is grieved. Why? I should have read 20 chapters instead of 15. Man, I should have fasted five days instead of I did three. But when you read, read about the grieving of the Holy Spirit, you don't see any of that. You see more on how we live. When we are young and on fire for God and we want to go and fast and pray, evangelize to everything that moves and we feel like, man, if I don't do that enough, I'm going to grieve the Spirit. No, no, no. If we don't do that enough, we can quench the Spirit. But that's not what grieves the Spirit. What grieves the Spirit is not how you minister. It's what could come out is the how we live. And there are three simple things that I want to highlight from the Scripture. The first one, and that is this, when we hold on to toxic emotions, we grieve the Holy Spirit. The Bible clearly states in here, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor be put away from you. Toxic emotions are emotions, I'll mention just three of them. Being, holding a grudge, having an offense and holding on to bitterness. Sometimes the closer you get to the Lord, the more on fire you get, the more prayer you start praying and the more you start purifying your life, what I've noticed about these people, myself included, is we are prone. We might not be prone to pornography, might not be prone to smoking and drinking. We might not be prone to stealing or robbing a bank. But we get prone to these petty sins called holding a grudge, holding on to bitterness, and staying offended. A grudge is something, if you nurse it, it doesn't get better. It gets worse. And the reason why many of us love to hold on to a grudge is because a grudge takes time and energy and we are unsure of who we are without it. We have replayed our personal betrayal and hurt movies so many times we know it by heart. The idea of moving on is so terrifying, whereas staying miserable is familiar. 
The offender has done nothing to deserve forgiveness. Harboring resentment stops me from getting hurt again and nobody can ever get close to me again. So it makes sense in our hurt mind. Well, at least I'm not doing any other heavy sins. But the Bible right after it says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit, it says this, do not hold on to bitterness, offense and resentment. The closer you get to the Lord when He starts freeing you from the demons of succubus and incubus and Jezebel and Leviathan and all of this stuff, there's something that we become prone to because we become sensitive to the Holy Spirit. We become sensitive to the voice of God is that we become overly sensitive to people. We take ourselves too seriously, develop a baby skin over the outer shell of our character instead of having a baby skin over the inner shell of our heart. We develop a very thin skin, easily offended and we get hurt very quickly. And if you just got on fire for God and you join a church that you have this high expectation from, man they will love me, this is heaven and earth, this is paradise and you find out this is not paradise, this is more like Hades. People here are like people, they have issues and they have problems and guess what, what begins to happen? We get hurt and when we get hurt we hold on to a grudge. You cannot host the Holy Ghost and harbor a grudge. You can have the Holy Spirit and harbor a grudge. You can host Him. You can have the Holy Spirit and hold on to an offense, but you cannot host the Holy Spirit and hold on to an offense. He's not hosted. When you, when you host somebody, you treat them with honor. You treat them with respect. They get attention from you when they come into your house, they're hosted. Versus somebody who just sneaks in quietly into the, into the room and just sits there. The Holy Spirit wants to be hosted, but He cannot be hosted properly if we harbor things. Offense is the second one. Offense in one of the most common words used for offense is scandalon. The scandalon is actually a Greek word that describes a trigger of a trap on which bait is placed. When an animal touches the trigger to eat the bait, the trap springs shut and animal is caught. When it's used in the moral context, what it means is this, scandalon indicates enticement to conduct which ruins the person in question. Offense is like an automated weapon. Once you pull the trigger, it keeps firing. Offense is always tied to pride and control. Offense, pride and control are the deadly trio. The moment you let offense in and let it stay, an offense will always give you a legitimate, justifiable reasons why you need to feel the same, this way. But while you have the reasons to stay and to harbor that offense, you must understand the dove is withdrawing. Because the Holy Spirit cannot be hosted where somebody is busy harboring something. You can't harbor an offense. You will be offended. I will be offended. Jesus says, in this world offense will come. He said, make sure that you're not the one causing the offenses intentionally. We will be offended. We will get hurt. We will get our feelings hurt. But what hurts the Holy Spirit's feelings is when we hold on to our hurt feelings and we develop theories, we begin to switch churches, we begin to gossip about people and we begin to hold on and become these people who hold on to a grudge, hold on to offense and then the third thing that becomes from that is this grudge, this offense becomes deeply seated bitterness. Bitterness is different than betrayal. Betrayal is what people do to you. Bitterness is what you do to yourself. Bitterness is internal. Betrayal is external. Betrayal happens, anybody can be betrayed. Bitterness is optional. We can choose to allow that. When you're not a Christian, or maybe you're not a believer, it's so easy to fall into that. But when you are a Spirit-filled believer, you must understand it breaks the Holy Spirit's heart when you hold on to bitterness. Now, I have not been hurt so bad in my life to experience this on a very deep level. Praying for somebody just last week whose wife been cheating and left him. And he now needs to deal with all of this stuff and big tough guy but crying like a baby and saying, 
I want to accept Jesus and I want God to give me a soft heart. And I cannot imagine what it takes for somebody to go through that. I interviewed, I think it was this year, a woman named Frida. Frida grew up in Rwanda. At the age of six, she realized that she was in the wrong tribe, Titsu, because they would make fun of them in school. At, I think it was 1994 is when the president, Hutu president, was assassinated. And what they did is they declared a war on this Titsu tribe and they killed one million Titsu in 100 days. It was government sponsored, government provided machetes, government provided clubs and guns. She was 14 years of age when they went running with their family. They ran to their grandfather's house and thought they were safe there. Now the biggest problem with this genocide is the people that were killing you were your neighbors. It was not the military, it was your neighbors. So they had such a good relationship with their neighbors, they thought our neighbors will never do that. We borrow sour cream from each other, we, we go to each other's houses, they'll never do that. Until the government declare to wipe out this particular tribe. So they go into the grandparents' house. At three in the morning, they get caught by their neighbors and other people. Now to be killed with the gunshot, you had to pay for it. So to be shot, you actually had to pay your assassinators or your killers for that. They didn't have the money. And so they brought the whole family and they each one had to choose a weapon by which they would be killed. She's 14 years of age. So she chose a club because she thought the club will be an easier way to die. But before they kill her, they first cut her mother's head off. And the rest of the family was buried at 3 in the morning. They beat her with the club. Turns out she didn't die. And later next day, around 3 afternoon, so 10 to 14 hours later, somebody dug her out and found out she still had a pulse. And so she recovered, losing all of her family. She struggled with stomach ulcers, chronic nightmares. I mean, the kind of trauma that you endure from your childhood, having this be done to you by your own neighbors that you grew up with, the anger that you feel toward humanity, toward God, toward everybody. She had a difficult time sleeping. She had migraine headaches, depression and everything. But then somebody takes her to church and at 18, she gives her life to Christ. She falls in love with Jesus, but she still hates the people who did this to her. And then she started to understand that I cannot hate them, but I cannot stop not hating them. And she started to ask the Lord for the grace to release the harboring feelings, the harboring hurt frustrations with both God the Hutu tribes and with other people. And she said it took time. And when the Lord removed all of that, the interesting part happened. The moment the heart became empty of that hurt, her future became brighter and God supernaturally healed her of every disease. Stomach ulcers were gone. The back pain were gone. Nightmares, they stopped. Depression was gone. And not only she had the strength to do that, she had the strength actually to go to those neighbors, some of them were already in prison, and to offer the forgiveness to them. And she said it was so difficult, so hard. But she said, with God's grace, I was able to do that. When you release that towards somebody who did that to you, you must understand, you are not setting them free. You're setting your future free. Because what happens when you stay in that harboring feeling of hurt and shame and guilt and even if what they did to you was unthinkable and they deserve to suffer, but the person that's suffering is not them. It's usually the person that's holding on to that. Unforgiveness is like drinking rat poison, hoping for a rat to die from it. Whoever opts for unforgiveness and revenge should always dig two graves, one for their enemy and one for themselves. When we hold on to those feelings, and we all have them, what, what begins to happen is they push away the intimacy with the Holy Spirit. And you may still read the Bible, you may still go to church, but if you are angry, if you are holding on to the previous church, how they treated you, and you can't release that, the Holy Spirit cannot be released to flow freely in your life. And I want to invite you today and encourage you today to let go 
and let God. Because the Holy Spirit wants to possess you and fill you so powerfully, but He cannot possess a vessel that is filled with toxic emotions. These emotions have to be pure. It's not because everything that's done is pure. It's that you are keeping your heart pure for the Holy Spirit. Amen. The second thing I want you to notice, not only the Bible says, let all bitterness and let wrath and clamor and anger be gone from you, but it says, and evil speaking be put away from you. The second thing, and that is this, the Holy Spirit is grieved when our speech is morally rotten. Morally rotten, if you read few verses before this, it says this, verse 29, one verse above the verse, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Let no corrupt word, the word corrupt there is the word that we use for a fruit that gotten rotten. The Bible says, let no corrupt word proceed from your mouth, but only that which edifies. Now, we live in a Christian world today, especially online. There are people that are rising up who are influencing young people and influencing Christians who think cussing is cool. Some of them even call themselves cussing pastors. Their idea of Christian liberty is this, we don't want to be legalistic because these fundamentalists, you know, made us dress this way, take our earrings and makeup. And so they swing to the other side where pretty much we be like the world, we throw F-bombs, we, we let all kinds of gutter language come out of our mouth because we're all about Christian liberty. And I call that greasy grace. That's not biblical definition. What is the first thing the Holy Spirit does when He fills you to the overflow? You speak in other tongues. If your tongue is not cleansed, the Holy Spirit is grieved. When Isaiah came into the presence of God, he vowed, woe, woe to you, woe, 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 woe to everybody until he got to the presence of God and he says, woe to me. I'm a man and the first thing he noticed that the problem was is his tongue wasn't clean. And he says, God, you need to heal my tongue. You need to cleanse my tongue. I want to encourage you today that the second area that grieves the Holy Spirit most is what comes out of our mouth. And there are three things that I'm going to highlight. One is cursing. The other one is lying and exaggerating. And the third one is being real with your words that actually come out to be harsh. Cursing. The Bible says when Peter denied Jesus, he cursed and swore. That was the state of somebody walking away from Jesus. Anybody who allows cursing to come out of their mouth is a person who already has something broken in the relationship with God. Now if you just became a Christian and you cuss like a sailor and honestly your English vocabulary was reduced to cuss words and you're learning kind of how to process that, listen, welcome to the journey of sanctification. The founder of KFC says, when I got saved, it cost me half of my vocabulary. When Welsh revival took place, not only the courts were closed, prostitution stopped, the judges didn't have a job, but there was one big problem. They had the coal miners, coal miners who were digging up coal. They had donkeys that carried this coal in these little places and the donkeys only responded to cuss words. So these coal miners get saved and now they're using normal language and the donkeys do not know what to do. So now some of them struggle to cuss again just to get the donkey moving. So they had to retrain and donkeys are slow. They had to retrain donkeys because donkeys only knew how to respond to the cursed language. Now, I grew up in a very strong, godly, healthy home. But because I was a teenager and I was in school and I was influenced, I wanted to be cool with my friends in Ukraine. And I remember for a week, I tried smoking. Yeah, repented of that. My dad found out that in Ukraine and uh, didn't, it wasn't good. The reason we're real, real, the real reason I quit is because we were having a test in Kyiv so that um, we could come to the United States and I was afraid they'll find it in my lungs and my dad will not let me come to America. <laughs> and he'll leave me in Ukraine to smoke and I was like, no, I don't want to go to America. I don't want to be in Ukraine and smoke. But there's a problem I developed as a teenager and it was cussing. I don't know how I picked it up. It was a vivid memory in my mind 
when being influenced in the school in the Ukraine, it was pretty popular to curse. So I picked it up and then I was cussing, but then the cussing took over me. I remember being so addicted to cursing where every word I would say outside of interacting with teachers was cuss words. Would walk on the streets and just curse like a sailor. Just everything I saw, I just cursed. And of course, I would come home and put my little Pentecostal mask on, zip my lip, muzzle my mouth and tame my tongue. But we had this thing that I had to do is milk a cow. And so I was milking a cow and the cow did something very foolish, you know, with his hoof. It hit the bucket so all the milk splashed on me. And I gave that cow so much glory. I mean, I just, it was like demons were manifesting out of me. I just, just let it have it. The cow, the cow doesn't even understand. But I just let it have it. Now at that time, my dad was walking by bar a barn. My dad is thinking it's the spirit of a Leviathan probably possessing the barn. He's thinking it's a demon that escaped Hades and is right now milking a cow. So my dad sticks his head and lo and behold, his beautiful, wonderful oldest son. My dad's like, what was all that? An accident. He's like, those colorful words do not come out as accidents. There were many of them for a long time. So in Ukraine, they had a different method of deliverance for children. My dad took me out of the barn. My pants were down. He used, I don't remember what, it was nothing bad. I know one thing, after that I never cursed again in my life. Deliverance by power. <laughs> that demon was gone like that. <laughs> Amen. Parents, you can try that on your kids once in a while when they're young. It is in the Bible. But if you're struggling with cursing, I want to submit to you to surrender your tongue to God because that grieves the Holy Spirit. If you say, well, I express myself. This helps me to express my anger. This grieves the Holy Spirit, the Bible says. Those who use profane language lack the vocabulary to express themselves without resorting to gutter language. No Christian should be guilty of such an unbecoming talk. Holy Spirit gives us self-control. And when I am angry, Christ's name should not be blasphemed. And when I am frustrated, unbecoming gutter language should not be, shouldn't be coming out of my mouth. You may say, but I think those things abort those thoughts quickly in your head and don't give them birth by verbalizing them. Amen. But the other part about our tongue is lying. Now lying is something that is like a snowball effect. The longer it is rolled on the ground, the larger it becomes, Martha Luther said. Lying is a deceit. Deceit often requires sufficient truth to make something seem realistic, to seem valid, to appear true, but in reality it's not. Partial truth is not truth but a little lie. Abraham sort of saw the tr said the truth. Uh, my wife is my sister. Almost had his wife be pregnant by some other man. Sapphira and Ananias came. They kind of said the truth. I mean, they sold the house. They did give money, just not all of it, but they said all of it. I mean, kind of rounded the numbers from 50% to 100. Drop dead. Exaggeration is not a mistake. It's a lie. And this happens in churches. This happens among Christians where we flat out exaggerate or we lie. Sometimes I remember I had a pastor in our church and the next day we went to eat and you know he asked me how many people we had. So I texted um, my assistant and she gave me the number. And it was a very low number. I don't know if he felt embarrassed or something. And I didn't round out that number. I just said exactly how many people we had. He said, no, we had 1,200 people yesterday. And I'm like, did you count? I was like, how did you see 1,200 people? We had three services and there was no way we fit 1,200 people. Each sanctuary seats only like 200 people. I said, we didn't have that. And he's pushing on me and he says, no, you don't know how to count. We had 1,200 people. I said, I don't know where you come from, how you guys count. But I'm like, we count usually people once. 
And I was like, I know that 1200 will make me feel good, but it's not true. Smith Wigglesworth said this, he says, I have asked the Lord to let me never tell this story except the way it happened. For I realized that God will never bless exaggeration. When you exaggerate, when you present a half-truth, you align yourself with the father of lies. Sometimes it's easier to just add something to it, to exaggerate something to it, to make yourself appear better. But you must understand, the Holy Spirit's name, Jesus says, is the spirit of truth. He honors the truth. He loves the truth. It's better to look small in the eyes of men, but be right in the eyes of the Holy Spirit than to look great in the eyes of men and to grieve the precious Holy Spirit. He's not moved by our numbers. He's not moved by our records. He's not, he doesn't care about if we had a million, a hundred, a thousand, whether you made a million dollars or you didn't. He doesn't care about that stuff. What he honors is the truth because he's a spirit of truth. And what he's allergic to is lies because that remind him of the devil and the spirit of the enemy. And so I want to encourage each one of us that we pray this prayer that Isaiah prayed. Lord, cleanse my lips. Lord, help me to say the truth and not exaggerate. Help me to say the truth in my workplace. Help me to say the truth to my wife. Help me to say the truth to my parents. Help me to say the truth to my children and never lie or exaggerate. Can somebody say amen? But the other part about our speech is harsh speech. The Bible says in Colossians, it says this, that season your speech with grace. And I used to not understand this. In our culture today, being vulnerable, Say it the way it is. Be real. Sells. It's very admirable and trendy. The Bible doesn't give us permission to say it the way it is. I didn't come on the stage the way I am. I put some clothing on. And for that we are grateful. <laughs> Imagine me coming in and saying, no, I'm going to come in the way God made me. Uh, mm -mm. Well, the way I feel it is the way I'm going to say it. And that's not my problem that you can't deal with the truth. The Bible has a word for that. It says, season your speech with salt. Some of us do not like food that doesn't have proper seasoning to it. And the Lord gives us a requirement, almost a command for our speech. We cannot say things the way they are. We, got, we cannot sugarcoat it. We got to salt it. The world sugarcoats it, but the Bible says put some salt, put some seasoning in your speech. That means that your speech has to carry a feeling of grace of God in it. It cannot be well, it's the way it is. No, 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 the way it is hurts. Give me some grace. Give me some salt. You are the salt of the earth. That means my speech cannot be just real and raw. My speech has to be seasoned. Even if we're correcting somebody, even if we're reproving somebody, the Bible clearly states that Holy Spirit is honored when I do not present someone real, but I give them something that is seasoned by salt. And that is grace. Can somebody say amen? So for those of you who maybe have a personality and you're like, man, I just like to tell people the way it is. They need, they need to get over themselves. You also need to understand that the Bible doesn't give you the permission to do that. The Bible gives us permission to put some salt in that. At least a little bit of salt. That the person doesn't leave that conversation feeling stupid, feeling below, or feeling like they're a total loser. But they feel that conversation knowing, yeah, this was a bitter truth. But there was some salt in it. There was grace in it. I know that I'm going to make it. I know that I messed up. But I'm not a mess. I'm a new creation in Jesus Christ. I know that I'm not my mistake. I know that I'm not stupid. I know that I'm not slow. I know that I'm not gonna, not gonna make it. No, I can make it, but I do have to work on my laziness. I do have to work on that. Parents, we have to season our speech with salt when we are frustrated with children, when we are frustrated with our spouses. We have to season our speech with salt when we are dealing with our employees, when we are dealing with our coworkers, and when we are dealing with volunteers. Tears. Why? Because every person has a value in God's eyes and God does not want them to eat your raw stuff. He wants them to eat stuff that's seasoned. Can somebody say amen? This was worth coming to church, fighting with your spouse, getting all the kids just to hear this today. <laughs> Come on somebody. Amen. You're like, how did you know we fought? 
I know how Sunday mornings go. <laughs> and the last thing, and that is this. The Bible says we grieve the Holy Spirit when we are rude to people. It says in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 32 that kindness, tender heartness and forgiveness should be our portion. It says about Jesus that Matthew chapter 3 verse 16 in the net translation, he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest upon him. A dove and a lamb. A dove is not a characteristic of the Holy Spirit. It's a description of the Holy Spirit. A lamb, excuse me, it's, it's a characteristic of the Holy Spirit, not a description. So is the lamb. It's a characteristic of Jesus, not a description of Jesus. I heard this statement from somebody. If you want the presence of the dove, you have to have the nature of the lamb. The reason why the Holy Spirit not only descended on Jesus, but the Bible says He remained on Jesus, is because Jesus' nature was not rude. He didn't say, come to me all you who heavy laden and who are troubled, I'll give you rest. Learn from me and you will see how snappy, impatient, rude and harsh I am and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus is not rude. Jesus is not snappy. Jesus is not impulsive. Jesus is not impatient. Jesus is not harsh. The scripture says, broken, bruised reed, he didn't break. What does that mean? It means somebody who's already bruised. You meet those people. They have a hard day and they vent to you. They respond through their brokenness by maybe being harsh and instead of coming back and breaking that, I say, That's what, oh, you, this is what you did. You're coming in understanding this person probably is hurting. And instead of coming and reacting, you pull back and say, how was your day? What's happening to you? I see you're flunking your work. I see you're not doing this. What is really happening? And then you find out that reed is bruised. And the Bible says the nature of Jesus is that he doesn't break bruised reeds. Meaning he gets to know people. He's kind to people. He sees that woman coming at the heat of the day, the Samaritan woman, and he's kind to her. He sees the blind people. He sees the lepers. And, and this is the nature of the lamb. The dove doesn't descend on a bull. The dove will not descend on a goat. The dove is not going to descend on some kind of a wild, crazy, this is just the way I am. This is just the way my personality. Well, that personality needs to be transformed. Because for the Holy Spirit to remain in you, there has to be inside of us a pursuit of kindness, tender heartness, and forgiveness. Humility, not being haughty. Kind instead of being harsh, being mean and being rude. And sometimes the more successful we get, especially those of us who grew up in a more of a dominant, you know, where the being a man simply means being mean. And the idea of being meek is being weak. Being meek is not being weak. It's being strong under control. It's controlling your strength. It's controlling your reactions. It's controlling your harshness. Why is that? Because the Holy Spirit is deeply affected by how we treat people. He loves people so much. And when He sees injustice, when He sees that somebody goes in and becomes harsh, loses tenderness in their heart, and they can say all the right things, with the wrong attitude. They can say all the right things but with the wrong spirit. The Bible says it grieves, it breaks his heart. I want you to rethink about what grieves the Holy Spirit's heart. It's not just about the things that we sometimes think. Do I harbor unforgiveness towards somebody and justify it in my head because they'd never apologized? Number two, is my mouth something that doesn't glorify Christ? Do I have a tendency to lie? Do I have a tendency to exaggerate? And do I have a tendency to tell it the way it is without seasoning it with grace? And number three, do I lack tenderness? Do I lack kindness? Do I lack forgiving spirit toward a human being? When I see a bruised reed, do I break it? I say, well, they should get their act together. Or do I portray and carry and develop and nurture the nature of the Lamb? He said, learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. What does that mean? Being harsh is hard on your soul. 
being gentle is good for your soul. Being kind is rest to your soul. When you find the way of the cross, when you take the highway instead of the shortcut, what we begin to experience is peace. And who gives this rest? Who gives this peace? The Holy Spirit because He rests. He can rest and when He rests, we rest. When He has a rest inside of my heart, I'm at rest. When He doesn't find rest in me because I am rude, I am mean, I'm snappy, I call people with names, I cut corners, I always jab, I punish people. You do something wrong to me, I won't respond to you. I'll let you drink your own medicine. And all of that stuff doesn't give Him rest. He doesn't like that. He withdraws and when He withdraws, His rest leaves with Him and I lack rest. I'm right, but I can't sleep. I'm right, but I can't put the relationship together. I'm educated, but I don't have peace. I have money, but I don't have rest. My mind is not clear, though my brain IQ is high. Why? Because when the Spirit withdraws, He takes all the kingdom, all of the presence that He carries with Him away. And we are left with our human depravity. We are left with our human weakness. And we are left with high positions, high ranks and all of that. But inside these cats are scratching our soul and we can't sleep, we can't think. There's no peace in here, there's no peace in there. We break one relationship, break second relationship, break third relationship and we can go for deliverance until these carpets get stained with our vomit. But until we take responsibility for our reactions and until we repent of our sin, because some of us blame demons for what our own nasty character is responsible for. Some of us, God does not say to always blame demons for everything. The Bible teaches us to crucify, put away all things, put on the new things and put some stuff away. Put off, put on, put away. Put off things, put on things, put away things. We have to have a role to play. Can somebody say amen? Then those children don't have to see a therapist. Those relationships can see the light of the day. Then the church can flourish and the Bible says they will know you. Not because you spoke in tongues and people cast out demons and because you walked around saying, but, but I've seen a miracle. Jesus says they will know you by the love that you have. And love is kind. Love is not supernatural, miracle signs and wonders. It's kindness. We need both, the supernatural. And our church focuses on that. We love that. But at the same time, we don't want to be supernatural jerks. We don't want to walk around mean-spirited, but God, I'm prophetic. And pathetic. <laughs> prophetic and pathetic. God doesn't want that to be. God wants us to walk in meekness and that's not weakness. Can somebody say amen? Come on somebody. I want us to rise. Thanks for watching this sermon. If this was a blessing to you, would you let me know in the comments below what stood out to you from this message? What are you taking home with you from this message? Also, if you enjoyed these messages, would you help us and hit thumbs up to this video and subscribe to our channel so you can get new videos every single week delivered to you on your YouTube app. If you go to hungrygen.com forward slash sermons, you'll actually be able to download the transcript, the notes and the quotes of this sermon and the rest of all of our sermons free of charge. Until next time.